The North American continent, completely surrounded by water, providing easy transportation for early explorers to reach this new land. Sailing vessel after sailing vessel came from Europe, bringing early settlers. An incredibly large chain of lakes was discovered in the continent. The Native Americans had used this chain of lakes as a means of travel for centuries. The Great Lakes, as they were soon called, stretched more than a third of the way across the land, and they provided a natural mode of early transportation. Just before the War of 1812, Robert Fulton and others proved the practicality of steamboats on the Hudson River. In 1815, seven Canadian merchants formed a company to operate a steamboat on Lake Ontario. The vessel, launched in September of 1816, was christened the Frontenac. Not relying entirely on her new source of power, she was a three-masted sailing schooner, 171 feet in length. Her noisy, high-pressure steam engine in the hold powered big side wheels, pushing the craft at speeds of nearly nine miles per hour. The Frontenac soon commenced a regular run the length of Lake Ontario, from Kingston to Niagara. Three years later in 1818, the Lake Erie Steamboat Company was formed by Buffalo and New York businessmen to operate a steamer for passenger and freight service on the upper lakes. At Black Rock, several miles below Buffalo on the Niagara River, a two-masted schooner 135 feet in length was constructed. The engine, built in New York City, was first taken up the Hudson River by sloop, then put on a wagon and hauled overland by oxen to the construction site. The new steamer was christened Walk in the Water as a compliment to a Detroit River Indian chief. She made her maiden voyage in August of 1818, a trip up the Niagara River against the current which required her engine, all sails, and 20 oxen pulling from a towpath on the riverbank to reach Lake Erie safely. The walk in the water provided regular service from Buffalo to Detroit, with an occasional trip to Mackinac Island. Each time she would approach a port, Captain Job Fish would alert the populace by firing a small cannon. Early steamers were built in similar fashion to the sailing craft of the day, with the machinery and side wheels added in the center of the vessel. It would be many years before steamers would venture from port without full rigging and sails. Many people felt these noisy, smoky side wheelers were a passing engineering fad and simply tolerated their existence. The steamers soon proved highly maneuverable in harbors, but more importantly, they could journey successfully on calm days, providing predictable schedules. Although passage was expensive, the steamers became popular with the traveling public. Several experiments were tried with other power sources besides steam. These included a square scow used as a ferry on the Detroit River in the 1820s. This boat had the usual large side wheels, but obtained power from horses driving a circular treadmill in the center of the deck. The steamers saw a rapid evolution within a short time. They became longer, larger, and used better machinery. Time for the passage between Buffalo and Chicago was greatly reduced, with some boats making the trip in close to three days' time. At first, Passenger accommodations had followed those of sailing vessels, the hold being divided into common rooms with separate areas for men and women. However, within 20 years of the construction of the first steamer, the passenger cabins were moved to an upper deck, freeing the main deck and hold for freight. Individual rooms and even suites allowed privacy. Some steamers designed especially for the immigrant trade retained the original open cabin or steerage style of accommodation. These steamers carried literally hundreds of immigrants at prices of $3 per person for the Buffalo to Chicago trip. By the 1840s, large numbers of steamers were engaged in the passenger and freight business on the lakes. At this time, lifeboats were not required, no vessel carried running lights at night, and the wooden hulls became unreliable within a decade. A major danger was the machinery, especially the boilers, which frequently exploded, sending shrapnel all over the boat. Some of these explosions were so violent the boat would sink within minutes. 
even worse than an explosion, were the frequent fires, especially on overcrowded immigrant boats. One steamer, the Niagara, connected Collingwood, a railroad center on Georgian Bay, to several Lake Michigan ports. She was 230 feet long, had three boilers, and used side wheels 30 feet in diameter for propulsion. On a clear fall day, September 24, 1856, she carried approximately 300 crewmen and passengers bound for Chicago. When near Port Washington, Wisconsin, the cry of fire ran through the vessel, a dreaded alert on dry wooden craft, and the fire spread very quickly. Nearby schooners, seeing the smoke, made their way quickly to the scene. Panic was in the eyes of all on board, and it was clear to Captain Miller the boat could not be saved. It was his hope the fire would hold off until help arrived. Just five minutes from the time the fire alarm was sounded, the engines were dead. Everything that would float was thrown overboard. Two lifeboats were already in the water, and while the third was being lowered, an overweight congressman leaped into the crowded boat, breaking it from the davits on one end, spilling everyone into the water where they drowned. Just 15 minutes after the alarm, the boat was fully engulfed in flames and everyone was in the water. By the end of the ordeal, more than 150 people were dead and the once proud steamer lay motionless on the bottom of Lake Michigan. Despite these horrible tragedies, life on the lakes went on and progress put a new demand on shipping. The Industrial Revolution was upon us and there were passengers and cargo which needed to go from here to there and back again. In 1841, Captain James Van Cleve, together with a number of other Oswego, New York captains, built a sloop named the Vandalia, 91 feet in length. For propulsion, it used the screw propeller recently invented by Captain John Erickson of Sweden. An early newspaper describing the unusual craft said, this boat is moved by what is termed the screw paddle, it being something between the buckets of the old paddle wheel and the ordinary auger, so propellers may be set in some measure to bore their way through the water. The propeller was an immediate success, and eventually every powered vessel on the lakes used the new device. By the mid-1850s, the immigrant movement had slowed and rail transportation was starting to take precedence over the lake route. One of the large vessel owners sold his entire fleet as soon as rails were laid to Chicago, believing the business had ended. However, there were still many markets open to vessels. The passenger boats were made more efficient, accommodations were modified, and many companies found large markets with people who traveled the lakes because they enjoyed it. Finally, many lines operated in connection with the railroads. Up to this point, boats were constructed of wood, but the builders continued to sharpen their pencils for new developments. In the early 1840s, several boats with iron hulls were built on the lakes and a number of Canadian firms brought iron boats into the lakes through the St. Lawrence River canals. In 1862, an iron boat was built at Black Rock, the Merchant, designed especially for passenger and freight service. This was followed in the early 1870s by three particularly noteworthy crafts named China, India, and Japan. These boats were designed for service between Buffalo and Duluth and were over 200 feet in length with separate passenger and freight decks, but they still carried a mast rigged for sale as required by the insurance companies. The top of the pilot house featured a carved wooden figure resembling a native of the namesake country. The passenger quarters still had separate gentlemen and ladies cabins, but in between was a large cabin used by all as a lounge and dining room. Off the various cabins were staterooms with running water. The quarters were paneled in maple with walnut trim and contained the finest furnishings of the day. Although Ericsson's propeller rapidly replaced the side wheel, one case remained where the older method of propulsion was used. On the overnight trip across shallow Lake Erie, it was felt the side wheels provided a gentler ride. 
the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company built several vessels which were the largest side wheelers in the world and were certainly among the most luxurious. The city of Detroit III, built in 1912, boasted three passenger decks and 430 individual staterooms. Ceilings were 30 feet high in the Baroque Grand Salon, and a gentleman's smoking room done in the Gothic style was on the top deck. The steamer featured beautiful stained glass windows and throughout was a masterpiece. The final era of passenger travel on the Great Lakes was the cruise business whereby people traveled by boat simply for pleasure. Among the foremost companies in the business was the Chicago, Duluth and Georgian Bay Transit Company. This firm built two large steamers, the North American and South American in 1913 and 1914 respectively. The vessels were simply decorated, which allowed them to operate for over half a century without becoming dated. They touched at most large ports, providing cruises to points throughout the lakes. While the passenger and package freight business dominated the early years of powered vessels on the Great Lakes, eventually it became very efficient to transport bulk cargoes by steamer. Finally, in 1865 and 66, a new type of vessel began to appear on the lakes. The boats were about 150 feet long, built to conventional schooner design, with Ericsson's propeller machinery installed under a cabin at the stern. A small pilot house was placed atop the cabin, while the bow carried only a single mast with a mandatory sail. This type of construction allowed over three quarters of the hull to be used for bulk cargoes, making a very efficient freight vessel. The new craft soon became known as steam barges, meaning they were self-powered barges. In 1867, the new type of steamer was built in yards all over the lakes by lumbermen who wanted reliable vessels to carry lumber. Soon the vessels also started carrying coal. Their engines were powerful enough to move several hulls, and soon the steam barges were seen towing one or more unpowered barges. In 1869, E.M. Peck commenced construction of a new type of powered barge at his yard in Cleveland. Peck designed the vessel especially for the iron ore trade. Christened the R.J. Hackett for the Northwestern Transportation Company, the barge was 211 feet in length and carried twice the ore larger schooners of the period could handle. The new vessel carried her pilot house and a single cabin on the bow and was the prototype of almost all the bulk carriers built for the next century. The Hackett was followed by dozens of similar boats throughout the 1870s. In 1882, the first iron bulk freighter, the Onoco, came out and carried two and a half times the cargo of the Hackett. This was followed in 1886 by the steel freighter Spokane of about the same size. Shortly after this, two bulk carriers were built from a different type of steel, which was more brittle than the steel of the Spokane. Both vessels broke up and were lost in their first year of service. With this exception, the new steel hulls were found to be reliable, with one early hull, the Samuel Mitchell of 1890, serving for over 90 years. The Onoco and Spokane set off a fantastic era of new freight vessel construction. In 1889, Captain Alexander McDougall of Duluth commenced construction of his famous whalebacks, designed to glide easily through the water. In 1895, a freighter of 400 feet in length was constructed followed within five years by one of 500 feet. The new boats were built at yards all over the lakes, and each one seemed to carry some revolutionary new feature. The Augustus B. Wolven utilized several new features. The most important was an arched frame, which made internal bracing unnecessary, leaving the hold unobstructed for easy unloading. She carried a triple expansion steam engine, whereby the same steam is used successively in three cylinders, providing maximum power. In capacity, the Wolven carried eight times the cargo of the earlier Hackett. The rapid development of the steel bulk freighter brought about the disappearance of sailing vessels from the Great Lakes. It was simply impossible for the smaller craft to compete with the large new steamers. In 1907, the bulk freighter reached a length of 600 feet, and everyone felt they had reached the maximum dimensions possible. Indeed, they were correct for a time, as it would be almost half a century before the first vessel over 700 feet would be built. During the intervening time, other progress was made in the evolution of the typical Great Lakes freighter. For propulsion, steam turbines, diesel engines, and diesel electric drives were used. 
Radio communications made it possible for boats to remain in contact with shore stations. And following World War II, radar provided information on the location of land or boats in any weather. Accommodations were modernized for crew members, but above all, efficiency remained the watchword. While the bulk freighter became the most common type of vessel on the Great Lakes, other types of cargo carriers were also developed. On Lake Michigan, large ferries were designed to carry whole freight trains across the lake on their enclosed decks throughout the year, winter or summer. Tankers were designed to carry petroleum products to ports all along the lake. Special boats were adapted for carrying cement, pulpwood, packaged freight, and chemicals. In 1902, W.E. Fitzgerald of the Milwaukee Dry Dock Company conceived an idea which eventually revolutionized Great Lakes cargo vessels. Fitzgerald purchased two existing crafts, and by rebuilding the holds and by installing special machinery, the boats became self-unloading. Other boats followed within a short time, including several built for the limestone business by the Wyandotte Chemical Company. With the conversion of the iron ore industry to taconite pellets in the 1960s, almost the entire Great Lakes fleet turned to self-unloading equipment. One of the few bulk carriers built between the two world wars was the Harry Colby, which came out new in 1927. The Colby, with a length of 631 feet and a beam of 65 feet, carried the record for the largest cargo of ore handled on the lakes for a number of years. Following World War II, the freighter again saw advancements in design, construction, and technology. Locks at Sault Ste. Marie and in the Welland Canal allowed passage of vessels with a length of 730 feet and a beam of 75 feet. In 1954, the longest vessel yet constructed on the Great Lakes was launched, the T.R. McLaughlin of 714 feet. This bulk carrier was followed in four years by the Edmund Fitzgerald of 729 feet and finally in 1960 by the Edward L. Ryerson of 730 feet capable of carrying 20 times the capacity of the R.J. Hackett. The Ryerson, like many vessels of today, is propelled by a 9,000 horsepower steam turbine and is capable of traveling at speeds of up to 23 miles per hour. Starting with some of the Canadian boats in the 1960s, it was deemed more efficient to place all the machinery, cabins, and pilot house at the rear of the cargo hold, once again returning to the special design first utilized immediately after the Civil War. In recent years, almost all the vessels built and designed on the lakes have followed this original pattern. In 1969, the new Poe Lock was opened at Sault Ste. Marie with limiting dimensions of 1,200 feet in length and 110 feet in width. The first vessel to utilize the dimensions of the new lock was the Stuart J. Court, a bulk carrier measuring 1,000 feet in length with a beam of 100 feet. The court has a carrying capacity 42 times that of the original bulk carrier, the R.J. Hackett. The Stuart J. Court was followed in rapid succession by others of the 1,000-foot class, now carrying cargoes for a fraction of the cost of the first bulk carriers developed a century earlier. For centuries, the Great Lakes have been a companion for thousands of individuals. The sailors, travelers, and immigrants sometimes came face to face with the fury of nature. They pitted muscle and machinery against awesome odds. The technological innovations developed over the years were products of practical ingenuity. These pioneers helped nations grow strong. They influenced transportation worldwide, and they brought an awareness to everyone that the Great Lakes are a resource, not only to be utilized, but more importantly, respected. <laughs>